free gift is not to license to sin a substitution he did it in, in advance for you you trust in that and it's okay no the free gift is remission of the past sins in mercy and then grace to what, what what's grace what's titus 2 11 the grace of god that brings salvation appeared to all men teaching us to deny ungodliness and worldly lusts live soberly righteous and godly in this present age that's what grace is Grace is not unmerited favor to give you a magic cloak for sin. We should all know that outside the system. It's the empowerment of God. Chariz is the empowerment of God to live a godly and holy life in Christ Jesus. That's why this stuff's important. That's why. Departure from iniquity. We have people out there that are telling people in 1 Corinthians 6, 9, and 10, those type of sins... That if they commit those type of sins, they'll still inherit the kingdom. Where Paul says directly in them scriptures, if you commit mur uh, adultery, fornication, homosexuality, sodomy, uh, murder, drunkenness, all those type of th that he lists in those, that one scripture there, and in Galatians 5, 19 through 21, Ephesians 5, but in 1 Corinthians 6, 9, and 10, that you will not inherit the kingdom if you commit those, that type of sin. But yet people, people are out there teaching these ministries that, that also teach holiness and obedience. But they're, at the same time, they're teaching people that, well, if they commit those sins, they won't be disqualified. They just need to confess. And they'll be okay. First John 1 John 1.9. Because if I say I have no sin, there's no truth in me. No, if I say I have never sinned, there's no truth in me. That's what that verse says. Not that if I say that I'm not corrupted in nature, I'm full of filthy rags and, and all the rest of those things we talk about all the time. That's what 1 John 1, 8 means. The Gnostics were saying they had a dual nature, the corrupted nature, right? The nature of man, his flesh was corrupt. Everything material was corrupt, but the spirit was pure. So they had no sin in their spirit. Well, that's what these people are saying. They commit these sins because Paul says all things are lawful to me, but not all things are profitable. Down there in the 12th verse in that passage. Well, that means, well, then he commits these sins, but they're not a transgression because he's not under the law, under grace, so they no longer count. That's how bad it is. That's why people post this stuff on our sites that it's a sin to stop sinning. That's why we see that stuff all the time. And it's coming from this side of the column, people. That's what you've got to learn to understand. That's where it's coming from that they're not only saying that you can't stop sinning, it's that you have this corrupted nature, that there's no ability in, within you until you're filled with the Spirit, and then maybe... See, everybody says God's going to clean you up and change your desires, but yet we know that never happens because the people remain in their addictions and they constantly fall back into those addictions. Again, this one brother gets... gets uh, email all the time from people that fell back into their pornography, their drunkenness, or went out and fornicated. And they still they think they're okay with God. You see that trite, complacent attitude towards sin under this mess? That's the problem with mixing all this theology up. That's the problem. These people who fall into those sins don't realize that's disqualification from the kingdom. Paul's not saying that, well, you can do those things occasionally in 1 Corinthians 6, 9, and 10. He didn't say that. He says, if you do these things, if you commit adultery and fornication, you go back to the vile things of this world, you're disqualified from the kingdom. You have to repent again if, if you ever repented to begin with. We've been over that in our second repentance messages, and it's in my book, it's on my website send you all the material you need just ask me but to these people the worst thing you can do is tell people to stop sinning because to them it's a sin to stop sinning because that means that you're trying to save yourself so if I tell a person that they have to stop sinning in repentance before God will grant mercy in his spirit well that's worse than anything else like one preacher said that uh, legalism is worse than adultery well, pharisaical legalism may be, and, and all those rituals and things like Colossians chapter 2 talks about. Those things have no, nothing that, against the indulgences of the flesh. You have to crucify those. But he's talking about anything that you tell a person that they have to do, like the one preacher I, I read right at the start here, 
that, that uh, says loving God is not about what you do or don't do. See, there's nothing in the Bible that... This person says, let me tell you that I believe the Bible supports the idea that a person doesn't have to really stop anything in order to be saved. We're not saved by what we do. We're saved by what Jesus already did. In other words, like I've said a million times before, it's not what must I do to be saved, it's what's already been done. That's what we're up against. And that's what's mixed in with these people's theology that cling to the old reformers. I don't care how holiness their, me their message appeared. I used to think that many of the Salvation Army preachers that wrote books on holiness sounded really good. Until I read them under this light of corrupted nature, again, and I see right in the first few pages, they talked about this very thing. that Well, these people didn't escape the corruption, so there must, have been, there must be something that still needs yet to be done. They didn't doubt whether or not the person ever came to a real salvation because they believed in what? Faith alone. Redemption, justification, and sin. They believed that the atonement took care of everything. And as long as the person trusted in that, they were saved. So they invented entire sanctification to wash away this stain of sin that yet remained in the people. But yet, what happened? It failed. It failed to bring about any results. And now we, we're up to the point where it's a sin to stop sinning. And it's a worse sin for us to tell people that. And then it's even the biggest sin of all is to tell people that you've stopped doing these things, that you don't commit, because they'll all say, well, you don't sin. You don't sin. That's the first thing they'll say. In other words, they, they look at you that you're committing, you're committing all these vile sins they're committing. You're still addicted to the vile things online. You're still going out and getting drunk every once in a while. Come on now, you're just lying. Well, we don't see face to face. So they charge you with that type of stuff to bring you down to their level. So you tell them you've had victory in Christ. You've went through this self-cleansing humility. You've crucified the flesh with its passion and desire. You're walking in faith, purifying your heart by obedience to the truth, having victory over the sin, the flesh, and the devil, through the exceeding great and precious promises of God, partaker of the divine nature, escape the corruption and sin the world through lust. And all of that promises in the Bible, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. No temptation has befallen me, such as common to man, that with the temptation God gives me a way of escape and I take that way. That's the worst thing you can possibly say in this generation. And again, I say, that's what we're up against when you mix in the atonement instead of reconciliation. It's not atonement. Atonement's not in the New Testament. I know it's in Romans 5.11 in the King James Version, but they changed reconciliation to the word atonement. And I've explained it in the past, and I've got plenty of material I've written about why they did that because they believed in this substitutionary penal model of, substitu of atonement back in the 1600s when they translated that version. So the whole idea of this payment or some kind of appeasement's been made that, you, that takes the place of your obedience and you trust in that first and then you render obedience. No, unless you go through that season. See, repentance worketh by love, right? Faith worketh by love. Repentance worketh, godly sorrow worketh repentance unto salvation, not to be regretted, right? Worketh, worketh, meaning there is, it produces observable results. Second Corinthians 7, 10 and 11. I've never seen anybody out of the church system ever refer to that passage for repentance or any other passage that talks about producing deeds worthy of repentance. But that one explaining it in full in verses 10 and 11 but it produces a preser observable result. That's what it means, works. That's the word for work. That's like going to work and producing uh, some work so you can get a paycheck. That's what that word means. Not the other word where God supplies the energy of His grace, the empowerment of His grace to work together with what you've put forth in that sacrificial gift of repentance that you've offered up to Him through love, faith working by love, a clearing and a zeal and a vindication and, like I say, a purity of heart. Then the blood can remit those past sins. Then, see, repentance is making that choice to turn from your evil path to a godly path, straight and narrow, 
observable then in your behavior. Repentance, 